Um, so a number of years ago, there was this guy named Jimmy Fallon who took over the late show with uh, David Letterman. Anybody remember that, that when that happened? That was a long time ago now. And, I, you know, I enjoy a lot of the late night things and other, I like comedy in general, so I'm a pretty easy recipient for those things. But the segment that he started that I like the most is something called Thank You Notes. Are you familiar with that? Maybe you remember it. Um, what he would do is he said that, on Fridays, he has a segment, most Fridays, and he said, on Fridays, I like to catch up on the events of the week, uh, make sure I'm aware of any chores that need to be done, and write my thank you notes to people or about things. And then, of course, it's, it's all a farce, right? It's, it's comedy. And so he pulls out a pencil, and he goes to write, and as he goes to write, there's a keyboardist who, who begins to play, and, um, and they try to make him laugh um, and, by staring at him. Let's see if we can... Thank you, pita bread, for being a great combination between wheat and envelopes. Right, and then, and then you pause, pause, and then they give everybody a chance to laugh. And then, and then when, when the pencil goes again, here we go. Thank you, emails that say you have successfully unsubscribed from these emails for completely missing the point. Right, right? Um, I, I, these are my favorites, so that's why you're getting these here. Thank you, half-off deal Groupon coupon for skydiving, for thinking that my problem with jumping out of a plane and hoping for the best is the price. Don't want to pay a lot of money for this. And um, thank you, peer pressure, for being totally not cool. Unless my friends think it's cool, then it's pretty cool, I guess. And then lastly, finally, Thank you, old belts, for sticking with me through thick and thin and thick again. Can we give it up for Susie? Well done. Well done. You too may one day be incorporated into a sermon. You don't know what might, what might happen in the future. But I love that, skit, uh, that sketch because part of what... Um, Jimmy Fallon is doing is reminding us of the importance of writing thank you notes. So these are all comical and, you know, whatever. But it is powerful when you receive a thank you note. I've received some already in my time here. And i got to say, it, it, it always makes your day better, right? A thank you note never makes your day worse. It's, it's one of these things that helps you remember that you're appreciated, that what, what, what occurred was valued, uh, and it made an impact. And sufficient impact for somebody to take pen to paper or to even in, even if it's a digital form, even an email thank you letter is a great thing. But, you know, yesterday I was blessed to be able to officiate a funeral uh, for a great saint. And she was 94 years old, and we celebrated her life. Her name was Nancy Taylor. And one of the things that we were able to celebrate, among her other attributes, was that she was a great letter writer. And people, you know, were talking about how they still hold on to Miss Nancy's letters that were written for her, uh, for, by her to them. They, they remarked at her extraordinary penmanship, which... I do not have that skill, and you know, and it's a lost skill, and so frankly, so is the lost art of thank you writing, and so I want to invite you to consider who you might want to think, write a, not, I'm not soliciting, I'm saying someone else, send it to someone else, send a thank you note to somebody maybe this week, and if it has to be via email, or text, uh, messaging, texting, or um, Instagram, or something like that, fine, let it be that way, but make sure that somebody knows that you've appreciated them. Th there's... Uh, you, prob you probably know this, but in case you don't, the majority of the New Testament are letters. And, and some of those are thank you letters. In fact, my favorite letter in the Bible, which, again, it's a lot of the New Testament in particular. All of Paul's le uh, books are letters that he wrote from himself to a community or to a person. Some of the ones from the general epistles, epistles means letter, by, the, uh, by Peter or James or John are letters from them to others. But the Apostle Paul writes one letter, my favorite in the New Testament, and it's called Philippians. Do you know it? In Philippians, the Apostle Paul has gone on a journey, and it's a journey in which he um, he, he shares the gospel, and as he goes forth and he shares the gospel, what he conveys 
is the love of God, that, that, that it's given him a joy that is, uh, it's hard to express, but he goes about his best efforts to express it. And he shares with people the salvation message that Christ, that God has come in human form, become incarnate, that Jesus lived among us and shared with us his message, that he, he was crucified, died on the cross, but he rose on the third day, and he came that I and you may have life abundant. And whenever he, Paul went, he typically went to synagogues of Jewish community people like himself. He was Jewish, and he would say, our Jewish, our Messiah has come. But our Messiah meant just for us, we thought, is actually the Messiah for the world. And this was a good message, and it was a, a letter of joy. But I just need you to know that often when Paul is writing those letters, he's in a situation that you would think wouldn't be joyful. More times than not, more, well, at least more times than we would hope, Paul is writing those letters in a position of being imprisoned, often for false accusations. He is innocently locked up. And at the end, he ends up losing his life, but not his eternal life, uh, at the hand of the Romans in Rome. And he writes the letter of Philippians from his imprisonment in Rome. But it's not the first time he's in prison. Instead, Paul has been in prison before in a place called Philippi, which happens to be the town that marks the Philippians. So let me take you on a little bit of journey here, because I want to invite us in the next four weeks to explore finding the joy that Paul embodies and he shares with others. And as we do so, I want to invite us to the words of a great Christian saint named Henry Nouwen. He's gone on to the Lord. Henry Nouwen was a great theologian, a, a priest, um, a leader of communities. He was a professor at Harvard and Union and other places. And he wrote something called Here and Now. And he speaks about joy in the midst of it. I have a bunch of quotes by him today, so bear with me. But here's the first of them, and I love it. It says, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It's a choice based upon the knowledge that we belong to God and have found in God our refuge and our safety, and that nothing, not even death, can take God away from us. So the Apostle Paul, you know, he embodied that teaching, teaching that Henry Nouwen proclaimed, but, but he got in part from the Apostle Paul. So this is what Paul does. He leaves the town he's from, Tarsus, here on the right, which is in today's Turkey. In that time, it was part of the Roman province of Asia Minor. And he travels to all of these different places, uh, some of which are letters in the New Testament. Uh, he writes his letter to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians. He writes his letter to the Col church in Colossae, Colossians. Uh, he, he, he keeps going and he goes to all of these different towns. And he finally gets to this point where he has a vision. He dreams that a man from Macedonia, that is into what is now Europe, right? Or into what was then Europe, uh, is over there saying, come, Paul, bring your message. Leave Asia Minor and bring also the message to us. Now, in case you didn't know, the gospel had already then gone to the Middle East in many places and to North Africa, but not yet to Europe. And so the Apostle Paul hears sees this vision of the man from Macedonia inviting him to come over, and he packs up, and with him he takes a friend named Silas. And Paul and Silas go on the journey into bringing the gospel to Europe. And the, look at the place where they land, a place called Philippi. You see it up there on the northern section, and Philippi was a Roman colony. Um, it was under Roman rule. It had a diversity of people. Many places had enough Jews to make up a synagogue. You had to have seven Jewish men to make up a synagogue. Philippi did not. It was only a town of about 10,000 people at the time, and it was located along a riverbank. It's not quite upon the coast. And Paul goes there, and he can't find you know, a synagogue or the Jewish community to proclaim the Messiah has come. And so he goes to where he can, and he goes down to the riverbank one day, and he meets a woman named Lydia. And down there, uh, talking to Lydia, he, he shares the faith, and she is struck by it, and she becomes the first European Christian. She converts to Christianity, Lydia does. And she goes home, she gets her family, she brings them back, and she goes, 
What's to prevent from us whole, all from being baptized? And Paul says, not a thing. Let's do it. And he baptizes all, every one of them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We find this in the Acts of the Apostles. It's not found in Philippians, but it's what gave rise to the church community that Paul could write a letter to a group of people known as the Philippians. Because he starts the church with Lydia. But he doesn't end there. We'll find out here in the midst of our time together that there's another man, unnamed, but he's a jailer. And he becomes another one of the first Christians in Europe and one of the founders of the church in Philippi along with Lydia. Well, the Apostle Paul, when he he goes there and he, he proclaims that gospel, but uh, every day as he leaves from uh, talking to Lydia and he, when I say talking to Lydia, Lydia says, come stay in my home. So she opens her home to him. Since there is no church building or Jewish synagogue to base out of, her home becomes the basis of the Christian church in, in uh, Philippi. And every day he walks out with um, Silas, and they go to share the good news in different places. And as they go, there's this girl. She's unnamed, but we, she's identified as a slave girl. That means that at some point in her life, she fell into slavery and she was bought by some people in Philippi. Particularly, there's two merchants who purchase her. How sad is that? They purchase her because she has a special gift, they think. That she has a gift of divination. She can do fortune telling for people. She can tell them about what may happen in their life. And people are compelled by it, and they pay a lot of money to be able to get her fortune telling back. And she has to give all that money to her owners. Well, every day as Paul and Silas are walking from Lydia's house into Philippi, here's this girl, and she yells out, These are sons of the Most High God. They show you the way of salvation. That was loud, right? That was, she yells it. She screams this. You know, she, these are sons of the most high God. They show you the way of salvation. The first time Paul hears it, I'm sure he's like, yes, this is true. Good. What about the fourth or fifth time he hears it? Every time he comes around the corner, there she is. If she sees them, she yells it. Every single time. They tire of it so quickly. They're like, listen, this is not what the way we want to. You're announcing to everybody you're getting too much. Like, we want to talk with people. We want to invite people into the faith. We don't want to scare people <laughs> into it. And, and so Paul and Silas are like, can you stop? She doesn't stop. She says it the same way every time. So finally one day, Paul looks at her and he points at her. And, he, and the scripture says he was very annoyed. <laughs> in case you didn't pick up on it. The scripture just labels very annoyed with her. And he says, he points at her, but he does so in love. And he says, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. That is the spirit that was within her that was not of God that was enabling this, this divine work, if you will. And so that spirit leaves her. And she's probably happy, and they're happy. She is set free. But who's not happy? The two merchants who had paid money to own her so that she would do this for them. And so they're furious. They're so angry that it, the Scripture tells us that they seize Paul and Silas, and they grab them, and they drag them to the marketplace, the city square. And there, there are magistrates. A magistrate is a person who can, on the fly, make a judgment about whether something's legal or not and choose to have somebody locked up or set free or pay a fine or something. And so the magistrate is there, and Paul and Silas go, are being dragged in front of them, and the crowd starts yelling, and the merchants say, these men are disturbing the peace. Not making that up. Look at the scripture. It's, it's Acts chapter 16, verse 25. We see all this. And, and, and they say that he's, they are disturbing the peace. And the crowd begins assaulting them physically. And then the magistrate passes judgment before the judge can pass judgment after the weekend. And the judge's sentence is this. That they would be flogged and thrown in the innermost cell of the prison until the morning. And so... We're told 
that the citizens of Philippi don't take little switches or sticks. They take rods and they beat Paul and Silas severely and then haul them off in chains to the prison cell in Philippi. Um, Paul, we, we actually have found, archaeologists have found, some of the ruins in Philippi that they believe are the, the prison. And this would have been the entrance to it, and it would have been a cave. And it's not a huge prison, but there's multiple cells within. And Paul and Silas would have been dragged to that space and locked up on the inside. And they would have been locked up, and then their feet would have been bound on the floor. And it's possible that they would have had chains. And I think this, this image that you have here for the sermon is actually downplaying the severity of their injury. I think that they would have been broken in places. I think they probably well have suffered a concussion. I think, I, I think there would be many parts of them that would be bruised severely. And we know that their clothing was stripped of them. I'm grateful that it still shows clothes, but you understand that it was even more severe than what you're seeing there. And so, you know already in years future that they get out of prison because he writes this letter, right? But let's stay with Paul and Silas in that moment. And put yourself there, won't you? Imagine that you're with Paul, you're Silas in that picture, and you're trapped right beside him. And what have you done is to tell people that God loves them <laughs> and that Jesus died for you. How would you respond? How would you be feeling? Well, we have how Paul responds. Again, Acts chapter 16, we're told, at about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. I mean, praise God, right? I mean, you're sitting there in that cell, innocent. <laughs> you've been accused. You've been already assaulted severely. You've been locked up. You've been stripped of your clothes, and the, the prisoners in the next cell are instead hearing you pray to God and sing hymns of praise to the Lord. I don't know what hymns they were singing. I, we don't have a record of the hymns that the Apostle Paul sang. I wish we did. What would you sing? Huh? What song would you be singing? What about the praise band? The praise band, any songs in particular you'd be singing? Maybe Amazing Grace? Yeah? Right? Can you just... Amazing grace, how sweet the us. Now, I don't make a joyful noise in human ears, but to the Lord, this is a joyful noise, right? And they're singing, right? I, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Here I am. What a majesty. Worship you, majesty. These are the, whatever was, I don't know, but I know that they were singing, the, the scripture says this, and I just want to invite you, I'm going to pause right here, and I need to say this to us, the next time you find yourself lacking in happiness, and feeling convinced that you are suffering unjustly, or you're locked up, or any number of other things, might you sing a song of praise to God? You don't have to do it out loud, but if you can, do it. But at least sing it in your mind and in your heart. I find that it's a renewing thing to do. And I bet if you were in the choir or praise band, it's probably something you do naturally, but many people don't. And, and it's good to have any number of other songs that we love that are on radio or that we, bands that we might adore. But I'm going to invite you to identify a hymn or praise song that you can sing to God the next time you're in a situation in which you're feeling like you would in that place. Paul and Silas are in that place, and they're not, they're not happy. Are they happy? No, they're not happy. Nobody's going to be happy that this is the, what they're experiencing. But happiness is not the same thing as joy. I'm going to say that again. Happiness is not the same thing as joy. And although their happiness, their freedom... Their fortunes can go away. Their joy does not. And so they are found to be praying and singing hymns of praise to God in the jail cell. And just then, do you know what happens? Earthquake. A great earthquake comes. It disturbs the foundations of that prison. 
the, the shackles, instead of being crushed by it, the, the footstocks that they're in become broken. The hinges break off. They're able to get up and walk out of there and go free. We're told that at that moment, the jailer wakes up. Hey, jailer, you weren't supposed to be asleep. <laughs> the jailer wakes up. He was supposed to be at duty, awake, but he's asleep. He's woken by the earthquake, and he leaves his house and goes to the jail, where he should have been anyway, and he finds that Paul and Silas, his prisoners, are still there. This is shocking. You know, when he saw that the earthquake had happened, the first thing he does is he pulls his sword to go take his own life. The reason, of course, being that as the jailer responsible for the prisoners being locked up, if they are set free, it's his life at risk. And so he's certain that the prison doors are open, so Paul and Silas have gone. But Paul and Silas haven't gone because they care about him more than they do about themselves. They also have a, the long game in mind. Their goal is not just to leave Philippi. It's to help bring Christ to Philippi. So they're not going to walk away from that opportunity before they claim it. And so when the jailer comes and he's about to fall on his sword, Paul and Silas see him and say, stop, we're still here. And he goes, why are you still here? Who would do this? Who would not leave? And they say well, that they were doing it for him. They're doing it as a witness to God. They're doing it because, and they witness to him and this man he asks to be baptized as well. He comes to faith, and his whole family comes to faith because of this. They add to the numbers of new Christians in Philippi. The next morning, the magistrates no longer are responsible. The judge is. The judge sees this case and goes, this doesn't hold any water. <laughs> you can't lock people up and beat them mercilessly, even according to Roman law, for this kind of behavior. They need to be set free to go tell the jailer to let them out, right? Like if only the jailer had known that, right? But, but when Paul and Silas hear this, they go, uh-uh, they want justice. And so they refuse to leave. Instead, they receive a public apology from the legal system in Philippi, and the public hears of this. And so Paul and Silas are able to witness without being fugitives anymore. They go back to Lydia's house. They pray together. They witness together. They eat together, they pack up their things, and they go on the journey the rest of their way. And years later, Paul's in prison again, innocently, for sharing the gospel in the city of Rome. And all those years between this event and his imprisonment again in Rome, and those more than 10 years that took place in between, Paul has found that the church in Philippi has just grown and grown. Although they are materially poor, they are also generous, and they've helped to fund his ministries and all of those other journeys that came after that. To Thessalonica, to, to Galatia, to all these other areas. They helped to fund that. And he is filled with joy and appreciation. And so he says the words at the beginning of the book of Philippians, of the letter. He says, he writes his thank you note. I know, Susie, I don't have you at the piano. It's okay. But thank you. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. That is the people of Philippi. Constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. Because of your sharing of the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this. That the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Christ Jesus. How beautiful is that? So what Paul has is a sense of, of joy. He's got a sense of peace. He's got a sense of God's care for him. And he doesn't let go of that, no matter the circumstances. His present circumstances are horrible, <laughs> often. He finds himself in prison, shipwrecked, beaten, accused, multiple times. And yet he embodies a joy that you and I are invited to. Paul's not always happy, but he's always joyful. Do you know the difference? I might not be happy with my, the way my food was prepared, but I, I'm, I'm joyful that I have something to eat. 
I may want something to be tweaked, but Lord, I'm grateful that I'm in this situation. It's born in part out of gratitude. And that gratitude, first and foremost, is in what the Lord has done for us. And so uh, Henry Nouwen says it this way. Joy is essential to spiritual life. Whenever we may think or say, whatever we may think or say about God, when we are not joyful, our thoughts and our words cannot bear fruit. Jesus reveals to us God's love so that his joy may become ours and that our joy may become complete. Joy is the experience of knowing that you are unconditionally loved and that nothing, sickness, failure, emotional distress, oppression, war, or even death, I might add false imprisonment, can take that love away. He also says this, joy is not the same thing as happiness. We can, buy, we can be unhappy about many things, but joy can still be there because it comes from the knowledge that God's, of God's love for us. We are inclined to think that when we are sad, we cannot be glad. But in the life of a God-centered person, sorrow and joy can coexist. You may grieve the loss of something or the missed opportunity or a hope not actualized, But I pray that no matter what happens up there, that the joy underneath remains. That you have such a sense of God's abiding presence with you and God's care and love for you and sacrifice for you. That no matter what happens on this other level, that you always carry with you a base of joy. You know, there's something called um, frequency bias. Ever heard of that? It has multiple names. It's the, it's the dynamic whereby the, the more we, w- once we notice something or see it, and we, we start looking for it more. And, and so if, if I were to say, there's a lot of red vehicles on the road these days, and you left here and you saw a red vehicle, you'd notice it, and you wouldn't have noticed it before. And then you're going to, guess what? All next week, what's going to happen? You're going to notice more and more red vehicles. It doesn't mean there's any more red vehicles. It means you're noticing them more. You have a frequency bias. I want to encourage us to a frequency bias of joy. (laughs) To choose joy. This week, choose to see the things that bring you joy. What brings you joy? Is it it your job? Praise God if that's the case. I can say it. I hope you can say it. Is is it your family? Praise God if that's the case. I hope that's the case for you as it is for me. Is it your home? Is, Is it the food you get to eat? Is it the freedoms you enjoy in this country? Is it opportunities you've experienced? Is it your ability to read? Is it your ability to exercise this thing? Is it this experience of a sports or a fandom that you have? What is among the things, the milieu of things that help to bring you joy? Notice them some more. And help to refill that inner well of joy that should be sustained at all times. Galatians chapter 5, Paul says that joy is one of the fruit of the spirits. That if you don't have it at all, then then God's not bearing fruit in your life through this gift. But but if you were to follow Christ, then that is among the fruit that should be emanating from your life. And so it's not enough to just have joy. We should share joy. So this week we're starting with finding joy. Joy. And choosing joy. Choose joy. Live into it. We have many a Christian who needs to emanate joy more than they have been. Amen? When you're outside of the church and you think, what are the, what's the church like? Few people go, oh, they're so joyful. But I, it should be part of who we are. Amen? It should be part of what we share with others. And I sure hope that the people outside of Centerville United Methodist Church can reflect on Centerville and go, oh, there are people with the joy of the Lord within them. And so two challenges for you this week. I know I've already said like four, but we're going to call it two. Number one, I want to invite you to start memorizing these words from Philippians. It's four short chapters over four weeks. I think you can read that much. I'm sure of it. And so... Take this first chapter and find yourself, if you'd like, a memory verse. But I do suggest one to you. It's from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. 
And, and it says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion and to the day of Christ Jesus. This is what Paul says to the church at Philippi. And it might just be the Paul saying to us. And so would you say these words with me? He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion and to the day of Christ Jesus. I want to encourage you to consider memorizing that and having that written upon your heart. And then secondly, you've noticed that there's one of these in your bulletin. Sorry if you're online. You didn't get one of these. But in person, you did. What is this? Glad you asked. This, this is um, a notepad. And, and there, you notice on the window back here, some people have put some up in this back section. And we want you to write things to help you to find joy. It's a praise to God. And you don't... Every week we're going to have a different question. So there's, there's four windows. So we're, four sets of windows. We're going to put some up next week on that one, and next week, and then that next week. But today, following worship, maybe reflect on one of the things that helps you to find joy, and gives you a sense of joy, and celebrate it and praise God by placing it up there on the screen. Thanks be to God. Amen.